Okay, so here we are. We're at lecture 13, advanced mean lecture number one. Uh, we will cover more next week or the next lecture, number 14, uh, on the actual uh, protocols, perineural protocols and regional diagnosis-based protocols. Uh, today, we'll cover um, everything related uh, to the knee, anatomy, uh, 3D anatomy, and we'll look at our, our needle locations for specific muscles. Some of this will be uh, repeated information that we've already had, uh, uh, similar to some stuff we got from the hip uh, from the previous two lectures, uh, because they uh, do attach uh, at the knee. We're gonna include them again, uh, maybe not as, in, in, in as much detail as last lecture, but uh, we'll, we'll get covered what we need to. So in that we'll look at, uh, for our knee structures, our upper leg, we'll look at the posterior thigh, again, the, um, the um, adductor magnus, as well as the hamstrings. Then we'll look on the anterolateral thigh, um, uh, rec fem, uh, the vastus lateralis, the quadricep there in sartorius. And then we'll look at our lower leg uh, here, tibia anterior, extensor dig, centralis longus, and the peroneals. We'll go to the superficial posterior lower leg here, gastroc soleus plantaris, and then the deep posterior, popliteus, uh, FDL, FHL, and tib posterior. And then on the right side of the screen here, you can see there's a number of um, uh, ligaments, tendons that we're going to have to look at. Um, so again, a lot of things happen here at, at the knee. Uh, we saw a similar amount of ligamentous um, uh, tech, um, structures there at the hip and at the wrist, and we'll see it again at the ankle. Uh, so we'll uh, look at each of these in detail. Some supporting evidence. Um, just looked up something um, that I thought interesting. Uh, um, again, a study by uh, Dunning, Butts, Young, Murad, Galante um, on periosteal electrical dry needling as an adjunct to exercise and manual therapy for knee osteoarthritis. Um, this came out in Clinical Journal of Pain in 2018. Uh, their objective to compare the effects of adding electrical dry needling uh, into a manual therapy and exercise program. Um, and looking for its response uh, with painful knee osteoarthritis. Uh, the Dunning group uh, refers to the dry needling, or they frequently refer to it as electroacupuncture, uh, but the addition of electrical stimulation uh, to their um, protocol, uh, which obviously I'm, I'm an advocate for that. Uh, they had 242 participants, uh, ended up with um, of groups of 121 each. Uh, here they received six weeks of electrical dry needling, manual therapy and exercise. Uh, primary outcome was related disability and they used the WOMAC to determine this. Um, the uh, folks that received combination of electrical dry needling, manual therapy and exercise experienced significantly greater improvements in their WOMAC. Uh, they were uh, 1.7 times more likely to have completely stopped taking medication for their pain at three months. So the discussion conclusion here, uh, the inclusion of electrical dry needling into a um, manual, um, manual therapy and exercise program was more effective uh, for improving pain, function and related disability than the application of manual therapy and exercise alone in individuals with painful NEO-A. And we will look at when we get to our regional diagnosis specific protocols, uh, protocols specifically for uh, OA. So we'll look at the 3D kinetic screen. I'll probably advance, advance through until we get to the, um, the, the lower piece uh, specific. Uh, but again, uh, a, a really nice uh, screening tool to, to, to rule in, rule out uh, movement abnormalities, symmetry in the body. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and come to that. And get rolling with that. Again, I'm gonna advance. Don't have your patients do it this rapidly. So for the knee, even our lumbar linear motion, um, looking at it from the side and from the front or back as well, we might be able to see some abnormalities with movement. Maybe there's a lack of uh, terminal knee extension during this or during the full flexion, maybe it demonstrates some tightness in hamstrings. 
or in tightness in the hip flexor. Uh, all sorts of information that we can gather uh, from this 3D kinetic screen. Similar, we may find that similar issue with our diagonal rotation. Um, if there is a significant uh, issue with uh, loss of range of motion into knee flexion, uh, that may uh, show itself here with our figure four sitting. Or if there's uh, some issues with, um, uh, say, the lateral collateral ligament, um, that, that may be something that presents itself there uh, as far as loss of motion or pain with the movement. Single leg stance could also tell us a little bit about um, uh, region problem in the knee itself if they're unable to, to maintain that single leg stance because of, of weakness in the thigh uh, or lack of range of motion uh, into extension. Uh, that could be an issue. Definitely the sit to stand could provide some information uh, to what may be going on. And just a nice quick um, review uh, or screening tool for what could be going on. Our forward uh, quarter lunge, we could definitely uh, pull out some information uh, from that. Uh, similar when we do the rear quarter lunge. Uh, lack of strength, lack of range of motion. Again, we'll look at for symmetry, for quality, quantity of movement, and those uh, also similar with, with heel walking and with our toe walking. Uh, same thing with the lack of uh, range of motion strength could be indicative of a problem that we're dealing with. All right, let's come back now. Okay, so let's start in the, the, the muscles, uh, the leg muscles themselves. Uh, we'll start with the posterior thigh of the leg muscles. Uh, here we're talking semitendinosus. Uh, we will jump momentarily to our 3D anatomy to look at these, uh, but we're going to talk semitendinosus, semimembranosus, uh, the biceps femoris, and then uh, the adductor magnus. So let's go take a look there. All right. So I've taken advantage of our ability uh, with, with this software. Again, this is complete anatomy uh, through Elsevier. Um, uh, we have permission uh, from them to use this as a teaching and authoring tool uh, to provide you these images. Um, we use it exclusively through, throughout this series. So first, our semitendinosus. Um, this just briefly. Our, our medial group, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, again, their origin off of the ischial tuberosity um, of, of interesting note, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a bit. And we talked about it at the hip. Uh, semitendinosus uh, on the attachment on the, on the ischial tuberosity, we have uh, semitendinosus, then we have the bicep femoris next, and then uh, surrounding that in a nice little tendinous sandwich would be semimembranosus. So their, their attachments are origin onto the ischial tuberosity. Um, uh, an interesting uh, design. Uh, anyway, the uh, semimembranosus uh, travels down uh, past um, the tibiofemoral joint uh, to insert on the tibia there we see the semitendinosus running a little bit further and uh, being terminally uh, part of the pes and serene. Uh, we look further laterally again, we have the bicep femoris uh, also with its uh, origin there in between the, the semi sandwich, uh, the bicep femoris highlighted there. And uh, as we go a little bit further distally, uh, we will note uh, the, the shorter head of bicep uh, femoris as it attaches into the bicep femoris tendon uh, with its insertion point on the fibular head. Uh, adductor magnus, uh, we have on, on the left leg here, Again, we discussed this in length uh, on the hip uh, section of the, of the lecture. Uh, but it does have a broad uh, origin on the, uh, on the pelvis itself, as well as along uh, the line on the medial aspect of uh, the, uh, the femur. 
and with its ultimate insert, ultimate insertion into uh, the adductor tubercle on the medial aspect, just proximal to that medial femoral condyle. All right. So for treatment, again, I'll, I'll, I'll run through these in, in just a moment uh, as we look through here. Uh, but with semitendinosis, semimembranosis, a, a general treatment approach will be one palm breadth uh, superior uh, from the popliteal fossa. It will be one thumb breadth lateral from that medial joint line, um, threading uh, through the muscle away from midline. Now to avoid that neuromuscular uh, bundle. Uh, let's come back, um, bicep femoris. Again, we do the same thing, one palm breadth uh, proximal to the popliteal fossa, one thumb breadth lateral uh, from that uh, midline and kneeling again uh, away from midline into uh, both heads of bicep femoris. On adductor magnus, uh, here uh, patient uh, for, for this general approach. Uh, on the hip, we, uh, you may recall, we had uh, a sideline approach uh, where we needled, <coughs> excuse me, in three different locations for adductor magnus, uh, adductor longus, and um, sartorius. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, gracilis. Um, but here, uh, they're going to be supine. Uh, you're going to have them lay uh, their leg ad abducted out into on, or onto your leg and you're going to needle from superior or, or or mat side or sky side down to mat side uh, perpendicular to that mat table uh, to go through. Uh, it's not on here, but you'll go through adductor longus as well as adductor magnus. So let's go take a look at those. All right, semitendinosis and semimembranosis. So the person is prone, we found the popliteal uh, fossa. We're gonna come up uh, one palm breadth and then for semimembranosis, tendinosis, we'll needle away from midline uh, to thread through those. For the biceps femoris, expand my screen just a little bit here. Biceps femoris, again, popliteal fossa, one palm breadth, proximal, uh, one thumb breadth lateral uh, from that midline, and then we'll needle away from midline uh, to get both heads of bicep femoris. For adductor magnus, uh, patient again gonna be supine. We're gonna rest subjects uh, thigh on treatment, uh, practitioner's thigh. Uh, we're gonna have them abduct so we can isolate. And then at midpoint between the knee and the hip, we're simply going to insert the needle and project it um, down towards the mat. And that'll get us through adductor longus and more importantly, adductor magnus. All right, now let's move back here. So here we are uh, for, um, that was the posterior. Now let's move anterior for sartorius and our quads. Uh, we'll move down, let's get to our 3D anatomy, and I'm just going to catch up here. Uh, absolutely great information to have. Review that. Um, origin insertion, we covered all of that in the hip, so I'm going to just highlight it uh, here. So here we are back into um, our program. Let me minimize that a little bit. That's better. Okay, so uh, sartorius, actually, let me make that just a little bigger. It's easy for me to see. Uh, sartorius, then coming off the ASIS, um, laterally traveling to the medial aspect and then across the joint line to then be the anterior most aspect of our pes and serene. Um, obviously, that could be needled anywhere along the path of that uh, muscle. Um, line or trajectory. I, I tend to like to kneel it right up here, you know, finger breadth or two, distal from its insertion on the ASIS because it's much easier to, to isolate there. I'm going to hide that. We'll look at rec fem uh, with its origin on the anterior 
inferior iliac spine. And actually there's, it's got a secondary uh, origin um, bifurcation there. Uh, comes down attaching into <clears throat> the quadriceps tendon um, before it uh, attaches onto the, the patella itself. Uh, that let us get down to uh, inferior to that or, or posterior deep uh, to uh, rectus femoris is the uh, vastus intermedius. Uh, I've isolated it on, uh, on, the, on the left side here. Uh, but as you can tell, it just sits uh, deep uh, to rect fem. Uh, when we needle um, rect fem, in order to isolate it from other muscles, we needle it up higher. There's a line between lateral apex of the greater trochanter and the ASIS, and we needle into that region uh, where those lines uh, intersect, and that lets us needle into that tendon of rect fem itself. Obviously, uh, for vastus intermedius, we would find a midpoint between ASIS and the patella, and right in here would give us our needle location. Obviously, if we're targeting uh, vastus intermedius, we are going to go through rec fem as well. So absolutely nothing wrong in the world with uh, needling through that to get the vastus intermedius. On our lateral aspect, um, vastus lateralis. Uh, with its origin on the in, intertrochanteric line of the greater trochanter, and then inserting into the lateral aspect uh, of the patella. And then similar to the vastus medialis, uh, it's going to insert into the medial aspect of that patella uh, with its, get a broad view here, uh, with its origin, uh, medial part of the intertrochanteric line and medial to the spiral line on the aspera of the femur. So there we are with our 3D anatomy of our uh, quads, uh, as well as sartorius. So for treatment, uh, we will cover that. So uh, I'm going I'm to skip past our instructional sheets here um, for these, lateralis, medius, medialis. All right, so let's go take a look those. All right, so for treatment, sartorius, we're going to palpate again, ASIS. Uh, we'll have them uh, pull their heel back toward us uh, so that we can identify um, sartorius as it's traveling up and over. We're going to drop down a finger breadth or two uh, further distally, and then we'll just insert the needle uh, through there uh, to isolate uh, sartorius. For rectus femoris, again, we're going to locate the lateral most apex, the lateral most portion of the greater trochanter. And then we'll find the ASIS, and there's going to, we're going to find a common line where those two bice, uh, converge, and that will be our, our needle placement there. Uh, that rect fem tendon is going to sit deep as it inserts it, or the origin comes off of the anterior, uh, inferior iliac spine. And so a longer needle will be necessary uh, to let hit backdrop uh, in order to actually hit rec fem there. For vastus lateralis, we will find midpoint between the knee and the greater trochanter. Uh, we're gonna have them ab ab abduct so we can identify the iliotibial band or the track, and then just cranial to that, or cranial, just anterior, to that will needle uh, in a direct method uh, onto the femur as a backdrop. Alternately, we can thread through vastus lateralis. We're gonna use the same approach, but instead of a direct, we're gonna needle uh, from sky side down to the mat. For vastus intermedius, again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna locate that midpoint between the ASIS and the patella, uh, and just simply gonna insert our needle at that midpoint down to the femur as a backdrop. Again, we'll absolutely uh, needle through rectus femoris uh, and the process of uh, needling vastus intermedius. Vastus medialis, our needle location, we're gonna find the medial uh, superior apex of the uh, patella and then two finger breaths, cranial and medial, uh, we'll insert the needle there into that bulk of that medial aspect of the vastus medialis. Uh, 
not required to hit backdrop in order to, to do that. Uh, but the, the deeper you get with that muscle, the more uh, surface area that you're contacting with it. All right, let's pause here. We're not there yet. Uh, so let's come back to our lecture and let's look at the lower leg. Here we'll talk about tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and then the peroneals, tertius, longus, and brevis. Tibia anterior, uh, the origin, and we'll, we'll talk about these individually in our 3D anatomy. Um, but tibia anterior, extensor digitorum longus, um, extensor hallucis longus, the peroneus, peroneus tertius. Uh, and I do have a, a reason that I start with peroneus tertius. It's all about finding our landmarks. Uh, as we're going through this lower leg. So uh, it's not a, that I'm implying that the tertius is the most important. Uh, it's there, there are times it's, it can even be absent. But uh, peroneus tertius, peroneus longus, and then lastly, peroneus brevis or fibularis brevis. So let's go to our 3D anatomy. Um, and let me jump back to my library for the lower leg. Okay, so here, um, uh, our initially, um, let me, I think we're good there. So we'll start with tib anterior. That. So tib anterior, its origin, the lateral condyle and the proximal half, the lateral surface of the tibia and adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg, which will be deep here. It inserts into, coming way down here, uh, the uh, inframedial aspect of the medial cuneiform bone and the base of the first metatarsal bone. So it's got some attachment on that medial cuneiform. Uh, so uh, we like to think that uh, it has, or uh, in my mind, uh, that it has an attachment uh, more on the uh, dorsal surface of the foot, but really and truly what gives its powerful um, inversion uh, is uh, it, its terminal uh, insertion uh, on, the, on the lateral and the inferior or the uh, plantar aspect of the foot. Uh, it's innervated by the deep fibular nerve and its action is it dorsiflexes the foot at the ankle and it inverts, inverts the foot at the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joints. Okay, that's there. I'm gonna actually fade that so that we can take a look next at the extensor digitorum longus. So as you can see, and I'm just gonna rotate here, uh, it really sits posterior uh, to uh, tib anterior, uh, but slightly anterior to uh, the fibula. And so uh, we'll use that to our advantage whenever we needle that in a second. Um, anyway, it's origin, the lateral condyle, the, tibial, uh, the tibia, the proximal three quarters of the fibula and the adjacent interosseous membrane. That interosseous membrane sits, uh, it's not visible here, but it sits in between the fibula and the tibia. Uh, we want to avoid uh, needling through that um, to avoid complications. Uh, so, uh, it's insertion, uh, the dorsal aspects of the base of both the middle and the distal flanges of the second, third, fourth, and the little toes. So you can see it, it travels a long way in, in its term, terminal uh, insertional points. Uh, its action uh, extends the second, third, fourth, and the little toes. And with that, with, uh, with the ligamentous support at the ankle, um, it also provides um, some dorsiflexion uh, at the ankle joint. It also uh, innervated by the deep fibular nerve. So let's move back up. I'm gonna fade that as well. And let's talk, let's look at um, the fibularis or the peroneus longus. Uh, so let me zoom in here. Uh, okay. So its origin, the head and the lateral surface of the fibula and the adjacent, adjacent intermuscular septum and its insertion, we're gonna follow it all the way down. It's gonna wrap around the lateral malleolus. Um, 
I lost my pronius longus. I mean, my pronius brevis. Um, let me go put that in there. I'm not sure I didn't have that. Okay, now we'll come back um, on Pronius longus. Okay, so it as well as Pronius brevis uh, travel around the posterior aspect of the, uh, the lateral malleolus uh, for the for the longus itself. It inserts into the uh, the plantar surface of the medial cuneiform bone, the base of the first metatarsal bone. So as we rotate this around, we get a look from the plantar surface. Um, that muscle, pronius longus, coming off of the fibular head and the fibula, uh, actually ends up inserting into the, into the great toe on the opposite side. So it has a long uh, travel across the plantar surface of the foot. Uh, its innervation is about the superficial fibular nerve. And since we're here, let's go ahead and talk about pronius Brevis. I'm going to fade longer so that we have a better view of brevis. Um, brevis has its, there we go, its origin, uh, the lateral surface of the fibula and the adjacent intermuscular septa again. And it's going to travel posterior to uh, the lateral malleolus and it'll insert in the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone. So it doesn't wrap around on the plantar side. Um, or the plantar surface to the medial side. Uh, it just stays here on uh, the lateral, right there on our very palpable um, uh, fifth metatarsal bone. Uh, its action is everting the foot at the subtalar transverse tarsal joints, and it assists in plantar flexion of the foot, also innervated by the um, superficial fibular nerve. Uh, we didn't cover the action of pronius longus. There, it also everts the foot, the subtalar, the transverse tarsal joints, and assists in plantar flexion, the foot at the ankle joint. So we have uh, tibialis anterior providing our eversion or our inversion, sorry, uh, on the on the medial side, uh, and its counterpart tib uh, pronius longus. Let's see. So. In, highlighted in, in, in yellow on the catch up, come on. So it's faded, oh, it's, it's unfade that. And unfade that. So here we see the two tendons, uh, tib anterior on, on, the, on the first ray uh, for inversion, and then also on the first ray in a cuneiform uh, for eversion. So, it all appears to happen right there uh, on that first ray. Uh, Peronius tertius. It is come out just a little bit here. Okay, so Peronius tertius, uh, its origin is the medial surface of the fibula and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg. And uh, it inserts in the dorsal aspect of the base and the body of the fifth metatarsal. So Peronius tertius and Peronius brevis both have a common, a fairly common uh, insertion. Uh, Brevis just has a circuitous route uh, around the lateral aspect of the lateral malleolus in order to let it uh, help with, with plantar flexion. Um, the action for uh, pronius tertius would be dorsiflexion uh, and it assists in eversion. Uh, also here, it is innervated by the deep fibular nerve. Okay, so. Uh, that gives us tib anterior extensor digitorum longus, pronius brevis, long, ah, extensor hallucis longus. I knew I was missing that. So extensor hallucis longus. And here now I'm going to fade tib anterior again. Gives a little bit better look at our extensor hallucis longus. Uh, origin the medial surface of the fibula, adjacent interosseous membrane of the leg, and then searching the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. Uh, 
so here its action is extending the great toe and to a smaller degree dorsiflexing the foot. Uh, again, it's innervated by the deep fibular nerve. And so having a good awareness of this lateral, superficial lateral compartment uh, of the lower leg, uh, our eversion, our inversion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, all greatly influenced by uh, this grouping of muscles. All right, so let's come back to where we are here and we'll talk about treatment. So for uh, tibia anterior, um, we're gonna, the needle point is gonna be um, two to three finger breaths distal uh, to the tibial tuberosity, and then one to two finger breaths lateral from the tibial crest. Uh, so we'll palpate that tibial tuberosity and, and then move um, uh, two to three finger breaths distal and then move laterally into the bulk of the proximal most aspect of uh, tibia anterior. This being a left, uh, kind of turned around there a moment myself. Uh, so we'll drop our two to three finger breaths it says one to two um, from there. One to two is actually more accurate. Um, you can always help identify this specific location. Have your have your patient uh, dorsiflex, and um, that'll help assist in, in locating that spot. Um, you don't want to cross the uh, uh, the interosseous membrane um, risk contact uh, with the neurovascular bundle there. So. Uh, keep it either superficial or um, with a, an idea to land onto the tibia. And then it will look just like that. Okay, so tibia interior. Uh, let's, let's do, let's go ahead and do these in order. So let's come here. Okay. Ah, those are already there. So tibia anterior. So um, tibial tubercle will drop two finger breaths inferior and then two finger breaths lateral to land into uh, the musculature there. Uh, it's not completely anterior to posterior. Uh, we, we will more uh, have a medial um, angle uh, with that needle. Um, again, you can have them dorsiflex and that will help uh, really uh, pop that uh, tibia anterior out for us. For extensor digitorum longus, um, here we'll palpate the anterior surface of the fibular head. And then we're going to drop three finger breaths distal and insert the needle into an anterior posterior angulation. Uh, the muscles is superficial, uh, so we'll be looking 15, 25 millimeters in depth. Uh, you might contact the fibula as a backdrop. Um, if you're uncertain, again, you can have uh, your patient. Uh, extend uh, toes two, three, four, five, and that will help uh, isolate uh, that muscle at its more proximal uh, attachment there. Again, needle locate angle here should be, um, it's kind of confusing, there's a little bit more of a, of a medial list on that, that needle. It should really be more superior, sky side to mat side to land on the fibula as the backdrop. Okay, so here we are, extensor digitorum longus, find the fibular head. We're gonna drop two finger breaths uh, to locate our location. And then we're gonna needle, again, superior or anterior to posterior or sky side to mat side to land on the fibula uh, to isolate, uh, extend EDL uh, for, for that. Okay. For extensor hallucis longus, uh, it can be best palpated as the patient extends the great toe. The needling location will be four to five finger breaths superior from the apex of the lateral malleolus. Say lateral, it can be medial if you'd rather use that. Uh, and it's going to be one finger breath lateral from the tibial crest uh, and a lateral trajectory, uh, lateral to postural medial trajectory with the tibia as a backdrop. So we'll come up four finger breaths and with its bear with me here.
Okay, let's let's see what we do here. Okay, lateral to posterior medial trajectory. Tibia is a backdrop. Okay, perfect. So let's look at it here. So we've drawn our, or put dots down our, our tibial crest. We're gonna be four to five finger breaths, cranial or proximal from the lateral malleolus. So we're gonna identify that. And I'm just carrying that tibial crest on down. And we're gonna needle from lateral to more of a medial approach, landing onto the tibia. And that's extensor halicis longus. For peroneus tertius, here, uh, knee location is located four finger breadth superior to the lateral malleolus. So the reason I use that uh, proneus tertius uh, and um, extensor um, halicis longus is it's very similar uh, height uh, or distance from the lateral malleolus uh, for our needle placement. Uh, but again, uh, four finger breadth superior to the lateral malleolus and it's anterior to the lateral fibular border. Needle angulation is gonna be lateral to medial, and there's, there's really no backdrop here. So here's our location for um, central halicis longus. We use that same uh, four finger breaths up from the lateral malleolus. And then we're gonna needle closer to the fibula this time, it's lateral to slightly medial to land into peroneus tertius. Pause there. All right, four, let me come back to, start getting some sirens outside the, uh, the office here. For peroneus longus, um, here, the muscle sits on the proximal two thirds of the fibula. So we're gonna drop four finger breaths uh, from distally from the fibular head. And we can use our fingers and bracket that muscle belly. And we'll just needle simply lateral to medial using the fibula as a backdrop. You're gonna drop that four finger breaths and needle lateral to medial. The fibular head, drop down four to five finger breaths. You can bracket the muscle and needle is just gonna be lateral to medial. You should have fibula as the backdrop there. Uh, proneus longus is a good bread and butter um, muscle to be needled. Okay, and then lastly here, proneus brevis. Uh, for that, we're gonna be three finger breadth superior uh, from the proneus tertius needle point or four finger breadth superior from the apex of the medial malleolus. Uh, so we're gonna be a little bit more proximal than here where we were uh, for uh, extensor halicis longus or proneus tertius. So we come of, of another three finger breaths here. Uh, again, it sits in the lower third of the distal fibula. So we, we don't have to be exact with our placement here, uh, but if we've needled proneus tertius or extensor uh, halicis longus, that'll give us a nice location. Uh, a good roll of thumb, pardon the pun, uh, a good solid uh, palm breadth uh, from uh, the lateral malleolus would be a good location as well. Uh, and then on that, we'll just need needle from lateral to medial uh, with the fibula as a backdrop. Again, that's probably a good palm breadth uh, coming up. My subject here was very small and thin, and so my hands are obviously much larger, uh, those that have met me uh, so that, that is her palm breath, not mine.
So here we are. We've got our, our four finger breaths from uh, the infra aspect of the lateral malleolus. We come up another two to three, and then we'll needle, if I can get my head out of the way, from lateral to medial, landing on to the fibula for peroneus gravis. Okay, now we'll move into the superficial posterior lower leg. Here we have gastroc, soleus, and plantaris. Um, I will leave this information uh, for your review. This information is already on the student portal. Um, and terrace, but let's take a look at it through our complete anatomy. All right, so let me, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let me throw all that muscle back in. There we go. So the gastroc itself, a medial and lateral head. Uh, the lateral head um, origin is the lateral condyle and the lateral supracondylar line of the femur. See, it's got uh, close proximity with uh, um, or trajectory there of the bicep femoris, the short head. Uh, anyway, uh, and inserts in the posterior surface of the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. Action plantar flexion uh, because it crosses uh, the knee joint. It is, a, is, a, is an assister with knee flexion as well, innervated by the tibial nerve. Uh, lateral, the medial head, medial condyle, and the popliteal surface of the femur. Again, same insertion, posterior surface of the calcaneus, calcaneal tendon, also plantar flexion, the foot, and flexing the knee joint uh, and tibial nerve. So again, we come uh, distally uh, into the tendocalcaneus where it travels to its insertion um, way down there. Okay, let's go ahead and Hide that and gastroc to bring out soleus and plantaris. So soleus. Well, let's let's cover plantaris first. So plantaris um, origin lateral supracond supracondylar line of the femur inserts in the posterior surface of the calcaneus. Uh, plantaris it's innervated by tibial nerve that assists in plantar flexion and assist in flexion of the knee. Obviously a super small, super tiny um, uh, muscle. Uh, how relevant is this? Uh, probably not all that impressive with any significant issue. Uh, it's a muscle that I frequently like to consider uh, that if there's a, a problem that I can't seem to, to isolate the true uh, pathology that's going on, that maybe plantaris is uh, the, the case. Clinically, I have needled plantaris. Um, uh, quite a few times. Uh, rarely have I ever found that plantaris is the solution to the problem. Um, however, uh, we do want to be able to address it in the event that uh, we're just having difficulty diagnostically finding uh, what's happening on the posterior aspect to give us our posterior pain problems. Um, so let's hide plantaris and then finally soleus. Soleus, uh, a nice uh, big, broad, powerful uh, muscle. Uh, its origin, the head of the fibula, as we come around. Um, so quite a few, uh, quite a few attachments onto the fibula. Um, it starts in the posterior surface of the calcaneus via the calcaneal uh, tendon, and it plantar flexes the foot at the ankle joint because it doesn't cross the knee. Uh, it doesn't assist in the flexion. Uh, also innervated by the tibial nerve. Um, head of the fibula, uh, I'm sorry, origin, the head of the fibula, posterior surface of the fibula, the soleal line and the medial border of the tibia. So this thing has uh, a pretty, pretty broad attachment, uh, generates uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of power. All right, we'll hide that. Now. Okay, let's come back. Uh, 
uh, for treatment. Uh, we'll find this is um, fairly straightforward, fairly simple uh, for gastroc. We're going to drop four finger breadths from the um, popliteal crease. Uh, we'll grasp the medial, um, more common than the lateral. You want to be able to needle both of them um, in, in either way, medial or lateral, or more likely both. Um, we'll needle with an angulation posterior medial to interlateral. So we just want to needle away from midline. Uh, in there, we do have uh, the neurovascular bundle uh, traveling, and we want to avoid that uh, when at all possible. So again, we'll come that four finger breaths, uh, distal from the popliteal crease, and then just away from midline, maybe a finger breath, thumb breath, uh, needling um, away from midline. So again, again, my subject is rather small. So I'm one, four finger breaths. And I'm staying away from that midline and I'm needling away from that to get into the um, medial head of the gastroc there. I can duplicate that and go one finger breath lateral from midline and, and needle um, in a, a lateral trajectory. Again, hit both heads of the gastroc and then we don't have to worry about uh, anything there in that midline, that neurovascular bundle. for the soleus. So here, what we're gonna do, um, um, and then both of these can be treated in prone or supine. Uh, for our purposes, we're doing this in the prone position. Um, midpoint uh, between the popliteal crease and the malleolus, or we can also call it the, the line of demarcation right at uh, the, mu the muscle, the bellies of the gastroc is a nice uh, location. But just distal to that, uh, we'll needle um, slightly away from midline um, into that. We can, we can try to catch it on the medial aspect or the lateral aspect. And, and then ultimately we probably will do a little bit of both. Anyway, needle trajectory is away from midline. So here we have the bulk of the gastroc and we'll just come inferior to that uh, to needle. Um, Medial is more common, uh, but we want to be able to do both. So again, I can have them plantar flex uh, to isolate uh, the gastroc. And just away from that, that midline, we'll needle through that. My fingers are on the back side or the anterior side uh, to make sure that I don't needle uh, too far. Uh, I can feel the needle approximating. Again, here we're doing it on the medial aspect, uh, but it can also be done on the lateral. Don't need a pull. All right. Okay, and then for plantaris. Again, it's rarely going to be clinically relevant. However, uh, we do want to be able to treat it. Uh, so it sits medial to the lateral head of the gastroc. Uh, caution, definitely taken in the popliteal fossa of the neurovascular structures. So at the very beginning of this lecture series, we talked about the danger zones. And the popliteal um, uh, region is definitely one where we want to be cautious. Um, this looks very close, but what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to find midline of the, at the popliteal crease. And then we're going to needle one thumb breath lateral from that midline. Uh, and where, where we're going to do this is at the level on the interior side, superior pole of the patella. So while your patient's in prone, uh, you'll have to reach around and palpate for the superior pole of the patella. And then uh, there on that lateral aspect, that'll give you uh, your, your location. And then you will be one thumb breadth lateral to that midline. You will, it's very close. You will, you will end up on femur as backdrop. So I, it doesn't show it here, but I will have reached around, find the superior pole of the patella uh, to then go lateral one thumb breath, or one fing finger breath, thumb breath, thumb breath, uh, away from midline, and then down to the uh, femur as the backdrop. Okay, so here we are on the plane terrace. So we know what we needled as far as um, 
our semitendinosus, membranosus, our bicep femoris. I'm palpating for the superior pole of the patella. Okay, then I'm, I have my midline of the popliteal crease or the popliteal fossa. And I'm gonna move one thumb breadth lateral at the level of the superior pole of the patella, right there. So I'll then take my needle, advance it down to the femur as my backdrop. I don't want to list this needle or angle this needle medially um, to avoid that neurovascular bundle. But if I go pure sky side down to the mat or a little bit of a lateral trajectory, I guarantee that I don't um, have any interference there with that neurovascular bundle. Okay. And now onto the muscles of the lower leg. Here, the deep posterior lower leg, we'll look at popliteus, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and then tib posterior. Now, these deep posterior lower leg muscles, and we'll get to this when we get into our next lecture where we'll talk about our protocols. Uh, these are always our go-to whenever we present them with a patient with plantar fasciitis. Uh, we will always want to deal with um, the, the, the muscles more proximally. Uh, several reasons. One, uh, that is the location of this neuromuscular tension. These muscles are on fire. Uh, more so, if we can needle up higher into the, into the muscle itself and relieve some of the load on the tendons on the plantar surface of the foot, then we can avoid needling into the foot. And uh, if you've never been needled in the foot, uh, you can know that that's a good thing. Uh, so always a good idea there. But we'll talk about that on our next lecture. Popliteus, similar to plantaris, uh, probably not involved that often, but, but I do see popliteus being a little bit more relevant clinically. Uh, matter of fact, within the past three or four months, I uh, had a husband and wife team that both came in uh, and their problem, both of them was uh, the popliteus. Um, they're active um, and for whatever reason, I can't put any statistical reasoning to it, but um, uh, needling of their popliteus solved their problems. So uh, we will, let's, let's take a look at these uh, in our 3D anatomy um, to get a better picture of what we're doing. Okay, and those we see here on the right. Actually, let me come back to the library. Let me get rid of some of that other stuff. All right. So now that I've done that, it's on the left. So popliteus, let's start here. So the popliteus muscle. Um, its origin is the groove for the popliteus muscle. It inserts into the posterior surface. Let's get this backward. The origin is here, the groove for the popliteus muscle. It inserts into the posterior surface of the tibia superior to the soleal line. Uh, so um, this is one of those odd naming conventions where the more tendinous attachment is the origin. Uh, and the insertion is more distal here. Uh, its action is it medially rotates the leg at the knee joint and it un unlocks the knee joint at the beginning of knee flexion. So we consider the vastus medialis as uh, our big helper and rotator of terminal extension, but it's the popliteus that unlocks, unwinds uh, to assist in the beginning of flexion. Innervated tibial nerve of four to S1. They will come down, we can leave that there. Let's go superficial to deep. On the tibial side or on the medial side, we will have the flexor digitorum longus. Um, here, let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. All right. Um, origin, posterior surface of the tibia, uh, inferior to the soleal line. So the soleal line is uh, this, bony ridge right here, soleus attachment uh, right there. So it's just inferior to the soleal line. Uh, it inserts the plantar aspect of the bases of the distal phalanges of the second, third, fourth, and little toes. So similar to the lateral muscles here uh, that crossed peroneus longus and brevis, 
that traveled, I will slowly get there, underneath to the interior. Here, uh, with flexor digitorum longus, we see it traveling on the medial aspect, uh, medial uh, malleolus, and it extends all the way out to uh, the toes. As you can see, all the leg, all the tendons, try to get, we can see that, uh, the tendons on the plantar surface of the foot, uh, just as likely, just as common for uh, tendinosis here uh, to be our culprit for plantar fasciitis, assuming that we don't have fallen arches and so forth. Again, much kinder to go up high than to needle down here. Uh, but anyway, that is the um, flexor digitorum longus. I will fade that. So one, one thing to be aware of. So for the flexor on the plantar surface, the flexor uh, digitorum longus is on the, on the medial aspect and it travels and controls the muscles on the lateral. Next, we look at flexor hallucis longus. It's on the lateral aspect, but it controls the toe on the medial aspect. So when treating, um, easy way to remember, it's the big toe, it's on the lateral, the muscles on the lateral. If it's the lateral toes, then it's the muscle on the medial aspect. Um, so let's take a little closer look here. So the origin of FHL is the distal two thirds of the posterior surface of the fibula and the adjacent interosseous membrane and inserts in the plantar aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. So again, it's traveling laterally uh, from the lateral crosses uh, inferior to the, uh, the malleolus and actually even further um, than tib posterior and a flexor um, digitorum longus. Uh, so it will come. So anytime we treat a patient uh, with uh, plantar fasciitis, very common for us to feel this band rope uh, sensation here. And we want to think that that's the plantar fascia. That is not in fact the case. The plantar fascia uh, is much broader and thin. This is almost always uh, the tendon of flexor hallucis longus. And so obviously being a non-contractile element here, we want to elicit a change. We needle uh, out here uh, on into the muscle itself uh, to release that muscle to give uh, improvement in symptoms there. Uh, tibial nerve innervation, we'll fade that and finally get to tib posterior. Tib posterior, its origin, the posterior surface of the tibia, it's inferior to the soleal line. Uh, so it's actually got, um, yeah, right there, inferior to that soleal line uh, and the posterior surface of the fibula. So again, another muscle with both a tibial and fibular uh, origin. Uh, it inserts in the tuberosity of the navicular bone, plantar aspects of the medial, intermediate, lateral cuneiform bones, and the plantar aspects of the base of the second to the fourth metatarsal bones. Its action it inverts the foot at the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints and plantar flexes the foot at the ankle joint, and it's innervated by tibial nerve. So we go to the plantar aspect here, and we see tip posterior is uh, responsible for a lot of stuff going on down here. Uh, you see where it attaches both onto the bases of the toes, but as well as the cuneiforms, um, a lot of attachment sites for that, that one little tendon. So we find that tip posterior uh, plays a pretty key role in what's happening uh, in the plantar surface of the foot as far as uh, uh, sensory problems or sensation pain symptoms, uh, as well as stability. Okay. So for treatment, for popliteus, and we'll, we'll cover these. So for popliteus, um, we'll grasp the medial uh, gastroc, medial proximal gastroc, We'll palpate, palpate the lateral, lateral uh, tibial border. The needle location is gonna be at the opposite level of the fibular neck and it's one thumb breadth lateral to the midline of the heads of the gastroc. So all that to say, we want, we're gonna end up needling medially into the, the, the insertion actually of popliteus. We're gonna do it at the fibular uh, neck. It's not the radial neck, it's the fibular neck. Um, uh, in, in this area. And so again, our, our idea is we wanna stay away from 
our midline structures, but our, our superior to inferior landmark is the fibular neck, uh, one thumb breadth lateral from midline. So pomplitius. I'm going to grasp that medial gastroc. We're going to find our fibular neck. So we've got our midline. We're going to be one thumb breadth lateral or, or medial from that midline using the radial fibular neck as our landmark for our superior to inferior cranial caudal um, needle placement. Definitely don't needle towards the midline. Uh, posterior to anterior work will work just perfectly. Well. Reflexor digitorum longus. We're gonna compress the medial gastroc at the mid calf and we're simply gonna needle from posterior to anterior, from slightly lateral to medial with the lateral aspect of the tibia as a backdrop. We will needle through soleus before we reach uh, flexor digitorum longus. Again, we're gonna compress, just grasp that medial a gastroc, mid calf, and needle P to A landing on the tibia as our backdrop. All right. Again, midpoint, going to compress right there. Needle posterior to anterior, and then landing on uh, tibia as our backdrop. Very similar needle placement for our medial part of soleus, quite honestly. Okay, now let's come back. For the flexor halysis, Longus here, um, we're going to compress the lateral gastroc at mid calf. We're going to needle from P to A using the fibula as our backdrop. So, again, a very similar uh, situation as we did for uh, the medial and the lateral piece of soleus. So, find our midpoint, we'll compress that gastroc, that's soleus at this point. And we're gonna needle posterior to anterior, hopefully landing on fibula as our backdrop. The flexor halysis longus. Okay, and then let's move the tib posterior. A uh, couple of different ways we can do this. You can do it from a lateral uh, or from posterior approach. From the lateral approach, we'll be three finger breaths distal from the fibular head. Uh, we're going to insert the needle and we're going to advance with a slight posterior lateral to andromedial angulation of about 10 degrees posterior to the fibula with no backdrop. So basically, we're just going to try to thread through that on the posterior aspect of the fibula. We can also take a posterior head direct approach. Uh, we'll compress that lateral gastroc belly, then three finger breaths distal to the fibular head. Needle angulation will be PA towards the fibula as a backdrop. So. So our three, finger, three fingers, and we're gonna needle posterior to the fibula. Likewise, yeah, we're gonna show it. Likewise, we can needle in a direct approach. In that same three finger breadth, we're gonna compress and we're gonna drop down. We're gonna needle towards the fibula as our backdrop. Okay, now tendons and ligaments, and there are a lot. So let's start. Um, let's start by just looking at our, our 3D anatomy here. Let's bring those up. Mm -hmm. 
and I frequently find myself needling uh, the, the, the ligaments, the connective tissue in, in the knee. So let's do this. I want to get rid of this, if it will let me do this. Well, it didn't. It's going to show everything. Okay, that's fine. So in, in the knee itself, we'll start um, most, let's start, let's start right in the front. So first we have some bursa to deal with. Uh, we have subcutaneous, the infrapatellar bursa, and then we have our subcutaneous prepatellar bursa. We also have our suprapatellar bursa. So uh, a lo lot of bursal components. Yes, we will needle into these. Probably more uh, frequently involved would be the infra, um, the super and the infrapatellar bursa. All right, so I'm going to hide those now so that we can see the rest of what we want to see. Okay, tendon of the quadriceps, obviously. Uh, both the tendon of the quadricep and the um, patellar ligament or patellar tendon, however we want to describe that. Let's hide that and let's hide that above. Again, we have a deeper, uh, the deep infrapatellar bursa. Posterior to that is the infra infrapatellar fat pad or Hoffa's fat pad um, that can um, condition where that, that fat pad can get stuck uh, between uh, the femoral condyles and the, uh, the tibia. There is an annealing approach we can use to pull that anteriorly uh, to hope to retrain that connective tissue, that fat pad, uh, how to stay out of there. Uh, from time to time, that will have to be surgically corrected. Okay, so we'll start moving um, around the medial aspect. Uh, the medial patellar retinaculum uh, designed to help uh, control um, the patella uh, its location. Since we're there, let's talk about the lateral patellar retinaculum. So connective tissue uh, for patellar stability. And then equally important, we have, undo that. All right, now we have the medial patellofemoral ligament. So anytime we have a patellar subluxation, uh, one of the things that are going to be compromised more than anything is this medial patellofemoral ligament. If there are multiple times of, of this location or subluxation, this may be either extremely um, uh, stretched or, or loosened. Um, equally, it can also um, tear. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of us have seen uh, that medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, and there's lots of different approaches you can actually use. Um, uh, tendon or ligament uh, as, as, as a graft. Uh, there's also a technique where a surgeon will just simply um, do a circular looping uh, suture around a lot of the connective tissue here to make a, a pseudo uh, ligament uh, to help restore that medial uh, patellar control. Uh, but medial patellofemoral ligament, we'll hide that, we'll move on similar the lateral patellofemoral ligament. So whenever a surgeon is doing a lateral release, uh, that is what they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna cut through uh, that uh, lateral patellofemoral ligament. Hide that, there is a bursa that sits on top of that, the iliotibial tract bursa. Iliotibial tract is not shown, uh, but it is uh, coming through here, IT band, iliotibial tract as it comes, attaches onto Gertie's tubercle. And so, um, we will needle that. Moving more laterally. Um, it's not the main one we're looking for. Here we go. So fibular or lateral collateral ligament. Uh, again, it attaches on the, on the femur and on the fibular head. There's also a subtendinous bursa of bicep femoris that could be uh, problematic. So let's hit those. And I'm going to go ahead and take away the joint capsule as well, since we're getting rid of things. 
so that we can see a little bit better. Get rid of the synovial membrane. Ah, there. Moving further posteriorly, we have the arcuate popliteal ligament um, coming off of the, uh, the, the lateral most part of the, the fibular head. Um, we also have uh, at the fibular head itself, we have the posterior uh, ligament and the anterior ligament. And for stability, uh, for fibular issues, uh, those can be needled and provide some um, symptomatic relief. So we'll hide those. We have the oblique popliteal ligament. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go into detail on proper way of needling that. We'll talk, we'll talk in, a, in a bit about, um, uh, tech, actually on the next lecture, uh, technique for uh, needling into the meniscus itself. Uh, one thing I don't target, I don't target uh, ACL, PCL. I uh, just haven't seen uh, research to support pro or con, and so I'm staying away from that at present. Um, further around, uh, let's see here, uh, the medial collateral ligament. We can definitely see improvement with function there. Uh, the semimembranosus bursa, uh, probably one of the more relevant would be the interim bursa. So uh, we see a lot, whether it's an athletic population or with our older population dealing with degenerative changes, uh, the pes anterine and anterine bursa uh, frequently come into play, um, as well as that medial collateral ligament. And so I think that's all of the ligaments that we're gonna talk about uh, here at the knee. Let's, let's jump back and see what we've got here. So the lateral patellar retinaculum uh, here and around the knee, similar to uh, what we see on ligaments in the wrist and hand. Uh, a lot of this comes down to, 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 to technique and specific location. Uh, for this, um, for the lateral patella retinaculum, uh, we will we'll identify midpoint of the patella. Uh, this little aspect of the iliotibial tract is it crosses the lateral joint line. And so we'll end up being, um, it can be, we can needle both anterior and posterior to that IT band. I will place an index finger over the IT band at that mid-level of the patella needle perpendicular to the skin surface. Uh, as the IT band approaches uh, the joint line, it gets much deeper and a little bit harder to isolate. So you just have to do your best to palpate uh, with active patient abduction uh, or resisted abduction uh, where that that IT band is crossing that joint line. And we can do it at the uh, level of the patella, uh, posterior and anterior to that. So here I've drawn uh, the patella. Um, this would be the, uh, the, the IT band uh, as it's coming across. And then here we are with our joint line. We find the medial as or the, the midline of the patella as that crosses, and we can needle both anterior or posterior to that um, the IT band as it crosses. Interestingly, that's also going to be the needle location for the, the lateral patella femoral ligament uh, that we can needle in that same spot. But we'll cover that momentarily. So again, lateral patellar femoral ligament. Uh, we're just going to move one finger breadth lateral from the uh, lateral border of the patella. Uh, but again, as you can see, that also is um, uh, the location of needling for the retinaculum. Here's the IT band uh, bursa as it's coming across, headed towards Gertie's tubercle. Um, so we can really, we can get a, we can do both here, um, same location for the lateral telefemoral ligament. So 
don't have to see that since I just showed that with uh, the, the lateral patellar retinaculum for the iliotibial tract. Again, we similar. We're gonna we're gonna find that midpoint of the patella, um, right at about the. Um, it's a little proximal to the medial joint line, uh, but what we'll do is do our best to locate the path of that iliotibial tract as it's coursing down, and a, as we get there, um, we'll be able to needle anterior posterior uh, into that uh, IT band. So again, this was for the lateral telefemoral ligament for the iliotibial tract. Again, we're gonna resist abduction to follow that IT band or the tract as far as we can. And then about uh, the, the, whatever the distance is away from that midline of the patella, we will needle into that. Okay, for the quad tendon, uh, we're just gonna move one finger breadth uh, superior or proximal to the superior aspect of the patella. Um, again, palpate superior pole of the patella, any location be one finger breadth superior to that in an anterior posterior angulation without a back foot. So again, I'm gonna palpate the superior most aspect and if you want, you can have your patient uh, accurately extend just like that. And that'll differentiate from the patella and the, the quadricep tendon itself. Uh, say one finger breath, if you need to come up a little bit more proximal than you can, if their point of inflammation, their pain, their tenderness is right at the patella, it could be the connective tissue there that's more of the issue. So you can needle uh, with a little periosteal pectin there as well. For the patellar ligament, the patellar tendon, uh, very similar. We're gonna locate um, midpoint between the inferior pole of the patella and the tibial tuberosity, uh, which is the attachment side to the patellar ligament. Needle location, it's at the midpoint. It's in an anterior to posterior angulation, and there's really no backdrop here. And that's very effective treatment for uh, patellar uh, tendonitis. So again, tibial tuberosity, inferior pole of the patella at a midpoint in between, anterior to posterior without a backdrop. For the tendons of the pes, and I, I, I specify the pes tendons versus the pes anserine bursa. When we get to uh, uh, pes anserine bursitis, we'll see that we combine these two together. Uh, so I separate them out here. So for this, uh, we're gonna palpate the medial joint line, uh, the patellar ligament and the tibial tubercle. We're gonna, the needle location will be one finger breadth distal to the medial joint line and two to three finger breadths lateral to the tibial tubercle. Tibial tubercle. Angulation will be anterior to posterior, slightly medial to lateral about 15 to 30 degrees. So basically, if you look at how these PES tendons uh, come in and attach, I want basically to, to needle across, um, across uh, the, the tibia itself and, and needle through those without necessarily hitting backdrop. I really, the target of my needling here is simply to needle through the tendons of the PES anserine. So here we see the pes anserine dropping down. I want to locate tibial tubercle. And then we have the medial joint line. Here we have the pes tendons coming. And so I'm simply trying to needle through that across um, the tibia, about a 15, up to 30 degrees uh, away from midline. For the tibial collateral ligament or the medial collateral ligament. Here we'll palpate the medial at the condyle of the femur. We're gonna slide distantly across the medial joint line to locate the broad fibers of the MCL. Needle location is gonna be in, in the joint line, 
medial to lateral angulation perpendicular to the skin surface with a backdrop of the joint capsule and potentially the medial meniscus as a backdrop. So follow that joint line over till you hit uh, the fibers of uh, the medial collateral ligament. And the needle is just gonna be medial to lateral, uh, landing onto um, either the feet. If you're exceptionally good, you can land on the meniscal tissue itself. If you have it to be a little bit more proximal into uh, the, under the femur, that's fine. If you look a little further distal under the tibia, that's also fine. The MCL having an attachment onto the meniscus uh, nice touch to go ahead and, and get a little pecking onto that meniscal tissue as well. Okay, the semimembranosus tendon. Uh, I, I pulled that out um, because it can be an issue of its own. Uh, here we're going to palpate the tendon of the semitendinosus as it passes the medial joint line. Uh, have our patient in prone and we can resist uh, knee flexion. Uh, to help identify that. Uh, it'll be just medial to the semitendinosus uh, and, and superior to the medial joint line and the P to A angulation with the femoral condyle as a backdrop. I'm gonna come in, gonna resist to isolate kind of anterior to posterior for that tendon. Okay, the medial patellar retinaculum. So here um, we'll palpate, identify the medi medial pole, the patella, and the interlateral border of the medial femoral condyle. Medial placement will be midpoint between those landmarks and perpendicular so the skin serves as the backdrop on the medial femoral condyle. Uh, we'll also get here momentarily, this will be the same needle location for medial, patella, medial telefemoral ligament. So I'll palpate for lateral border of the patella and for the femoral condyle. And our needle is going to go right in between the two. We'll find the same basic approach for the medial patellofemoral ligament. And that's the same approach as we saw on the lateral aspect. Uh, the, the needle uh, for the patellofemoral ligament and the retinaculum are virtually identical. So since we just did that, we can skip on to it. But again, one finger breath medial to the midpoint of the medial patellar pole, perpendicular to the skin surface, down to the condylar backdrop. So now the anserine bursa. Um, anserine bursa sits between the tendons of the gracilis and semitendinosus and the medial collateral ligament. We'll palpate here for the space between the two ligaments, one finger breath distal to the medial tibiofemoral joint line to find the needle insertion point. Needle angulation is just medial to lateral with tibia as a backdrop. So as we follow these tendons down, um, crossing that joint line, we're gonna drop one finger breath below the joint line to get our needle location. It's barely visible there, but in that little green area, that is the anserine bursa. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna isolate, find that medial joint line. We're gonna we're gonna palpate for the, the muscles as they cross, and then one finger breadth distal to that medial joint line could be just a little bit further inferior, but uh, inferior to that joint line is where we will get uh, our pes anserine bursa. Again, angle tra needle trajectory just medial to lateral landing onto the tibia. Uh, posterior, the oblique popliteal ligament. 
The location is going to be two finger breadths lateral to midline of the popliteal fossa, posterior aspect of the patellar midline. P to A angulation with the femoral condyle as a backdrop. So we're going to feel around, palpate for that midline of the patella, and uh, it'll be two finger breadths in that, that superior to inferior landmark that's going to give us our location. There's going to be two finger breadths lateral to the midline. The oblique popliteal ligament. And then we'll needle meniscus posterior to anterior. With the arcuate popliteal ligament. Here we'll palpate for the tendon of the bicep femoris as it travels past the knee joint line to attach to the fibular head. Uh, knee location is going to be one finger breadth superior and posterior to the bicep femoris attachment on the fibular head. And angulation will be lateral to medial onto the tibia. And lateral to medial on the tibia. And then isolate the bicep femoris tendon itself. Here we're going to just pal palpate for the tendon about two finger breadths superior to the fibular head uh, to determine the needle location, angulation being the lateral to medial without a backdrop. Resist that flexion. Target that tendon itself. And we'll just needle lateral to medial. We have the posterior ligament of the fibular head, and then we'll have the anterior ligament of the fibular head. Uh, for posterior ligament, we're going to Palpate and determine the boundaries of the fibular head, quite simply. Uh, the needle location will be in the posterior half of the tibiofibular junction, anterior, superior, to inferior angulation. I'll tell you, we're also going to do the anterior ligament of the fibular head, and it's going to be the exact same on the anterior aspect. So definitely want to be able to identify that uh, your, your, your posterior, superior, anterior borders of uh, the fibula, fibular head, and we'll needle just into. Uh, that joint space. So we'll do 37 and 38. Again, we'll come in, we'll palpate uh, the boundary of the fibular head, and we're just going to needle into that space. Uh, odds are all we're going to do is get the connective tissue itself, the ligament, uh, perfectly fine. Um, we'll have anterior. Well, let me stop here. Let's let's do lateral collateral, and then we'll come back to the interior. Oh, I tell you, there we go. So for the lateral or the fibular collateral ligament, um, we'll palpate, determine the lateral joint line and the lateral collateral ligament. If you need to go into a figure four position to let that LCL pop out, uh, it's a little bit more easy to palpate because it's not attached to the meniscus. Um, and then we're going to just need a lateral to medial without a backdrop. Again, I can, I can resist, I can strain that, that lateral collateral, let it pop out. And then needle placement is simply lateral to medial. It's a smaller ligament than the uh, medial collateral. Uh, so test several times to make sure that you've got the right thing. And then here we have the anterior ligament of the fibular head. So very similar. We just want to find that sweet spot and drop needles straight in there. And when, when would you needle that if they're having 
if they're symptomatic in the knee or the fibula, uh, that may be a sign that uh, some kneeling would be appropriate. Follow that up with a little, uh, some joint mobilization there, uh, but uh, anterior posterior ligaments um, can provide some improvement. All right, done that. All right, so we've been through all of the muscles and ligaments, bursa uh, surrounding the knee. Uh, good news, uh, similar to when we did the hip, no homework this time. We'll, the homework will come at the end of lecture number 14, uh, which should be um, uh, in the next two to three weeks. I don't have that directly in front of me, but uh, that, that's coming up next. There we'll cover all of the um, uh, perineural protocols. We'll cover all the diagnosis specific protocols. Um, a lot of times the, the knee is one of our bread and butter uh, regions. So we spend a little bit extra time here. Uh, so. If there is uh, anything else we need to cover between now and then, feel free to yell at me. Otherwise, um, I will see you here in two to three weeks uh, for the practical application of what we've worked on here. Uh, any questions, just yell and let me know.